Hey, good evening, and welcome to the Comics Experience Graphic Novel of the Month Club for our Comics Masterpiece uh, Club. This is, uh, this is our brand new uh, uh, club where we're looking at uh, comics from the whole history of comics. Um, uh, and this is our, our inaugural edition. Uh, and our book this month, as you can see from what I'm holding, is the fantastic, we love it so much, Preacher. Uh, and we are really, really, really blessed to have uh, Garth Ennis with us here. Uh, hello, Garth. How are hey, you, Brian, my friend? How's it going? It's going thank excellent. You. It's going excellent. Um, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, this should Pleasure. this should be fun. It's it's always fun to talk about comics with you. Um, my first question always is, and I think it's a great question: Why comics? Of of all of the things you could be doing, uh, why is it that you chose comics as your um, as your field? Yeah, I think that's I think that's because I I kind of hit the sweet spot. Um, I came along at a point where uh, Alan Moore had started to uh, make his way from British to American comics. Um, I was a big fan of 2000 AD and other British comics, and they were pushing the envelope just a little bit. And I think uh, I think Alan really took that and ran with it. And his American work, then of course, uh, you know that came back to the UK. Um, people became aware of it through that. They became aware of people like Frank Miller, Hard Chick, and Paul Chadwick. Um, and what that meant was, it was a time when comics seemed as if, as if you could do something interesting with them, um, that you weren't going to be simply telling the same repetitive stories that they weren't a medium that people just automatically abandoned at 12 or 13, maybe a little older. Um, it looked as if it was a time, uh, or re really it looked as if comics time had come. And um, right when I was 16, 17, reading all this Moore and Miller material, uh, I was thinking, yeah, I'd like to do this. I, I, I find myself really believing in the medium and what it could do. I'm not sure I would have articulated it quite like that at the time, but I had a, a strong sense that this was where I wanted to work and this was where I could do things. It was I was really just inspired by what I was reading. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Did you did you go to any? Um, uh, did you have any education in writing? Uh, none. No. None whatsoever. None at all. No, I um, left high, what you would call high school at 18. I uh, went to college for about two or three months, hated it, left. I had no formal training. Um, all I had was um, there's a very old 2000 AD annual where they reprinted a script, uh, a John Wagner script along with some Brian Ball and pencils and inks and then lettering over the top just to show you how the process worked. Mm -hmm. And um, I took a look at that. The format seems simple enough. You describe what you want to see, then you write in the dialogue that goes in the balloons. And that was as much as I knew really before I started setting off ideas. Interesting. And you're, you're like 18 years old when you're doing this or was this a little bit later? Uh, I started sending things off when I was 18. Um, there was a comic called Crisis, which is spun off from 2000 AD. It was a political comic. Um, there was a signing tour when it launched in the fall of 88, and that tour came to Belfast, and I met Pat Mills and Jim Bakey and John Smith, but I also met the editor, Steve McManus. And I can remember asking Steve, given that he was doing a political comic, would a story about the what are called the Troubles, sure. or what were then called the Troubles in Northern Ireland, be what they were looking for? And he said, that's exactly what we'd be looking for. So uh, this is about October of 88. Went home, took a couple of weeks, put an outline together, sent it off, called the crisis office on my 19th birthday in January, and more or less got the job. 
Yeah. Yeah, and that was Troubled Souls. Yeah. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. Troubled Souls, which is a fantastic book. Uh, um, uh, what what made you, what gave you the hubris to think that at, at 18 that, <laughs> that you could become a, a, a published writer? Um, I think it was probably being too dumb to know that I really shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah. I uh, as I said, I wasn't enjoying college. Uh, and so I was really trying to think about ways out. Now, that doesn't mean that I thought, ah, I know, I'll get a job writing comics, to get, and that, then I won't have to go to college anymore, because that's a bit like, I know, I'll buy the winning lottery ticket tomorrow, or I'll, buy, I'll find a suitcase full of cash under a park bench or, or right. a bar. Um, so it was really just not knowing any better. And, um, that, that's what, that's why I talked to Steve. That's why I sent off the idea. I, I should say I did find out later on that at this point sales on crisis weren't very good, that they launched well, uh, fallen away quite quickly. I think from 80 to 30,000 in about six months and they needed something fast. And they went through the pile of submissions, which I, I'm told is a dispiriting experience for any editor. And they found this thing, and it was, I suppose the phrase would be best of a bad bunch. And they needed something fast, and that's how I got in. Yeah. Um, you did Troubled Souls with, it was Will Simpson? Is that right? No, am I it was John McRae. It was John McRae. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, at that point, Will and John were, were really the only two artists working in Northern Ireland. Okay. And Will was very busy on Judge Dredd and Rogue Trooper and um, other things for 2008. And because this story was so Northern Ireland, so Belfast oriented, and this is before the internet where, you can, where it's easy to supply reference, Sure. it just helped to have someone who who was already on the ground as it were did you did you pitch it with john or or did john come after they accepted the script um i let me see i as i recall i contacted john because i knew him anyway because he worked in a comic store at the time he was he was running belfast for first comic store and i knew he could draw he'd gotten a little bit of work for marvel uk in 2000 ad and I said to him, would you draw this if it was accepted? Mm -hmm. And he said, sure. You know, I'm sure thinking, right, kid, you know, let, let me know when the UFO lands to take you away or yeah. something else equally likely. Mm -hmm. And then they accepted it. And I said to them, it really should be a Northern Ireland artist. This is more hubris, of course, through pure ignorance. Sure. And they said, yeah, you're probably right about that. And I said, there is this guy. And so a couple of weeks later, or about a week later, I see John and I flew over to uh, to London, basically to talk Steve McManus and uh, a couple of other people at the company at, in the crisis office through the story. They were, after all, taking a massive chance. I was a complete neophyte. John had had about six, maybe 12 pages published, um, and they wanted to be sure of what they were getting. So we talked them through the story. John showed them some samples he'd done, and they seemed to think it was good enough to take a chance on. Yeah, uh, Crisis was a monthly. Yeah, not um, not a not it, a fortnightly or. It started out as a fortnightly. I think it went monthly later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So was there was there a concern on your end to be able to produce the work in a timely fashion at that point, or? Um, at that point, and, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm remembering sure, no, I know the events of 31, uh, th yeah, 31 years ago. But yeah. at that point, I think I would have, I would have done whatever it took. <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, all right. If all they, right. um, if they needed it, you know, yesterday, I would have gotten my time machine and got it to them yesterday. I wasn't worried about uh, about producing on time. As it turned out, I was able to do the job to a standard that, that satisfied them uh, in pretty reasonable time. I mean, the episodes I think were eight pages. Today, that would be maybe an afternoon's work. Even then it was a couple of days. I, yeah. uh, as you know, my stories are heavily dialogue driven. And even then I loved writing the dialogue. I wasn't terribly good at it then, but 
Um, but I, I did like writing dialogue. I like driving the story forward, seeing who was going to say what next. So it, it helped. It's always helped that the job is a, a very pleasant one to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so cutting your teeth on those eight page stories, uh, a crisis and then on to 2000 AD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that that gave you a better foundation? So, cause, cause one of the things that I always wonder about, especially with American comics, right. Is, is there 20, 22, maybe 24 pages, depending on when you're writing them. Um, that's actually a, it, it's really easy to, to, to not have a very tight focus story in that kind of space. Does, is that, does, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, yeah. Writing eight episode chunks. And I think later they, re they reduced it to seven um, of the story. Yes, there was, there was a lesson there to be learned. Um, I continued to write stories like that. Gosh, at, at least for another year, I, I think it was um, some time before I wrote my Hellblazer sample tryout script. Yeah. Um, that probably would have been in the spring of 1990. So yes, I was I was doing those short, snappy scripts for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I feel like it's um, it's a good muscle that 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 modern creators don't really get you know particularly because i i you know we have these graphic novel clubs and i talk to a lot of these kids who are you know again they're 18 20 years old uh that they went to school for this and right. and they're being asked to do 200 page stories out of the gate right. you know uh, yeah. <laughs> i can't imagine keeping focus when i was 20 on 200 pages of something you know yeah. uh i mean you know i suppose youth probably finds a way yeah um, uh, you know you, you do what you have to do but there, there is a useful discipline to be had from getting it all into six or eight pages and uh, i mean I, I british comics uh, are like that to this day people starting out in 2000 ad still have to write six pages of judge dread or six pages of you know whatever they're doing for it now i i did a couple of uh stories this year um they're actually written last year for um a couple of uh kind of anthology specials that uh, the 2080 publisher is putting out and uh, they were 10 pages each and i must say i enjoyed it just as much as i ever did so that muscle you described doesn't doesn't go away doesn't atrophy i uh, yeah. find it just as much fun as ever yeah um uh what was the reaction of your friends and your family to to you becoming a professional writer in crisis um i think initially uh my my parents were a little edgy about it particularly my dad especially when it came to the notion of leaving college yeah uh but when i started making a living at it and he could see, and i got more work accepted and he could see that this wasn't just uh i know this wasn't something that was going to go away anytime soon he relaxed a bit um my friends at that time very few of them were really into comics and so telling them you were going to start writing comics was a bit like saying you're going to the far side of the moon it's like yeah okay fine uh let, let us know when you get back um but then you actually put the, the the finished product in front of them and they get they, they go ah right okay i get it yeah. yeah yeah uh was there uh much of a difference i don't know culturally or acceptance wise between crisis and then when you moved on to 2000 ad and, and writing dread and things like that um you you did find that people had heard of judge dread even if it was only vaguely. Uh, now, there'd been no movies at that point, but um, the character did appear in a newspaper strip as well as in 2000 AD, and, and he had made his way, broadly speaking, into the consciousness. So, yes, yes, you did find people going, oh, Judge Dredd, yeah, I know. Yeah. The, um, uh, the, the, the British industry is really kind of on the, or at least then, uh, was on these weekly anthology books, yeah, yeah, yeah. 2000 AD, Beanie, Dandy, you know, Dandy, yeah. things like that. Um, yeah, yeah. 
was, uh, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to sort of figure out like that market and what it was like at the time. Well, what you were, this was still at the point <clears throat> where the British comics market was largely a mainstream one. What you, uh, what in the States would be called a, a newsstand market. Yeah. where a comic like 2000 AD would sell 100,000 copies a week yeah. and it would be expected to keep producing that. It was the sort of sideways turn into uh, perhaps a, a more comic shop market uh, where that began to change. Um, and I think at this point today, 2000 AD sales are are way way done and it does exist effectively as a as a comic shop publication you can still get it on newsstands and people do but i think it is largely driven by its fans whereas in those days it wasn't a fan public based publication at all um comic fans bought it but it was really something that kids picked up on their way home from school every friday or whenever yeah, yeah. um uh in in because you said that, that that john was managing the first comic shop in belfast <laughs> and you were living in belfast yeah um uh, i live just outside belfast a little town oh, okay. called hollywood uh hollywood L. yeah hollywood. Just L. originally originally hollywood i think there uh -huh. was um i think there was a convent there okay. uh around a thousand day day or something like that okay. but yeah, hollywood is close enough to belfast that you hop in the train and you're there in 20 minutes yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, what was, I mean, how, how were you getting exposed to comics, uh, early on? Apart from a 2000 AD and other British mainstream titles, I didn't encounter much else in the way of comics, especially in terms of American comics mm. until I was about 16. Um, as I said, Alan Moore, who I'd encountered in 2000 AD, uh, had made it to America, obviously the Swamp Thing, Watchmen, so on. And he and uh, other American comic writers and artists had uh, come to the attention, not just of British comic fans, but also of, of some British music fans. There was, uh, it was a paper called the NME, which was quite famous at the time, New Musical Express. Yeah. And they were pretty culturally aware, and uh, there was a guy... Uh, one of their guys called Stephen Wales, who always kept up to date with what was going on in comics. And a friend of mine read the NME, and he and I were both really interested in this stuff. So I had heard of things like The Dark Knight, Electra Assassin, Watchmen, like Concrete. And uh, I actually, the, the first American comic that I read from cover to cover was The Dark Knight. I found a copy of the trade paperback in a bookstore actually mm -hmm. in Belfast. Um, before that, one of the, the things about growing up in a small town in Northern Ireland was um, the distribution of comics was a little bit limited. And so whereas John grew up in Belfast and had reasonable, if perhaps patchy access to American titles, I had none, none at all. I saw these things occasionally. I saw their British reprints. Um, but never to the extent that I was really able to get a, a proper sense of what American comics were all about. You, you would just see the occasional superhero title and flicking through them. To me, they had nothing to offer next to 2000 AD, next to Judge Dredd and characters like that. Um, I, as a matter of fact, the distribution where I grew up was so limited, we didn't even have Warrior. Um, I, I encountered Miracle Man and V uh, when they were uh, reprinted in America and, and then continued in American comics. I, I never read Warrior as a kid. Wow, that's kind of crazy, actually. But. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, what was I going to say there? Uh, it, so your the first American comic that you bought was Dark Knight. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. What a, uh, I mean, that's kind of... Um, it's kind of a big comic to be your first one that it you've is. read all the way through. It is. Uh, it's it's in at the deep end. Um, and of course, um, as I say, I ha not having read any others and having no experience of them, I, I immediately thought, 
oh my god what have i been missing out on all american comics must be like this they must all be this good i must yeah. go out and buy as many of them as as possible as as soon as i can uh so i i w went to a few uh stores not comic stores just newsstands you know corner stores and i bought a, about a dozen titles and i took them home and you can probably guess they were bloody <laughs> awful <laughs> they really were and of course you know you, you understand yeah. later on that what a departure dark knight was sure sure from that stuff you know what frank yeah. had been building up to over the years yeah. um i mean god even his daredevil work back in the early 80s when he when he was writing as well as drawing yeah. is is such is such a, a leap forward from the the majority of what else is being put out absolutely um I, I do sometimes think that it is that weird skewed perspective that set me a long way down the path i'm on because not reading superhero comics as a kid not having any affection for them i do have this peculiar almost unique point of view um with which i make my way through comics um not liking superheroes, not having any affection for them. I have no desire to repro endlessly reproduce uh, the characters and stories of my childhood like a lot of people are. Otherwise, I might just be one more guy writing the X-Men. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, encountering Dark Knight on the backs of, a, of the weeklies where, you know, yeah. the average the average comic, right, is is like... I don't know, four or six panels a page, right? But Dark Knight, like, you know, 16, 24 panels on a page sometimes and and telling stories in a in a very different way, you know? Yeah. Um, yes, I'm, qu I'm quite a brutal, vicious story. I mean, obviously, I, yeah. knew, I knew what Batman was. Everyone knew sure. what Batman was because they'd seen the old, um, oh, gosh, I TV can't show? remember it the name of the actor but the old tv show with yeah, adam the, west yeah yeah adam west right yeah. I, you know, I watched that as a kid i really enjoyed it as a kid so i knew who and what batman was and was all about but seeing it kind of turned upside down like that and turned into this extremely brutal noir narrative yeah uh that was one of those those things that that kind of rang a bell somewhere and said, look, look what you can do with this medium. And a big part of that, of course, was the art, yeah. uh, the way you're describing, you know, the, the way Frank told that story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So how did you make the jump from crisis to 2018? Right. Um, that, that was pretty simple. Troubled soul got a lot of good attention. Now, I, I'm not fond of it and I tend to disparage it now, but more than one editor and writer has said to me that raw as it was, it did demonstrate decent storytelling sure. um, from the writer's perspective. So maybe it wasn't a very good story, but it was a well-told, not very good story. Yeah. And one of the people who noticed was John Wagner, who was the original creator of Judge Dredd and was writing it to this day. He was... Um, he was looking to uh, move more into American comics. He was also involved with the launch of the new Judge Dredd magazine, which was at last Judge Dredd in his own comic. And he just didn't have time to write the weekly strip anymore. And casting around for people to, to write it, uh, his eye lit on me. Um, and so he had a word with the editor, Richard Burton, and that's how I got the job. So he approached you. You didn't. You didn't pitch for it. Oh no, no. I mean, as far as I knew, no one wrote Dread except John. I I knew none of this stuff that was going on in the background. Uh, John and Alan Grant, as far as I knew, were the only people who wrote Judge Dread or, or ever would, uh, apart from Pat Mills on on the Cursed Earth story. But apart from that, it was John and Alan forever. Now, at this point, they were alternating rather than working together. They, they had a pretty successful partnership that had recently broken up, and they were they were kind of taking it in turns to write the weekly strip. But John was moving on. Alan, as you know, was working more and more for American comics. Yeah. I think he did quite a long run on Batman and the Demon yeah. and so on. 
and uh, really they needed more material. Um, so the first I knew of it was when Richard Burton phoned me up and said, John Wagner's not got as much time on his hands as he used to. He needs someone to take over Dread. Would you like to do it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> How's that even a question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I was flabbergasted. You know, as far as I was concerned, this sort of thing didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. And so, were you um, were you anxious uh, at this, or were you just, you know, with the hubris of youth, uh, more, I can do more this? Hubris. More hubris. I'll just jump in with both feet, and it'll be fine. Yeah. I mean, it's it's so amazing. It's so exciting. What a chance. How wonderful. How could it possibly go wrong? Of course, it yeah. went wrong really fast because I sure. was not equal to the task. Um, I spent two, maybe three years on and off working on the strip, and I never got a grip on it. Um, yeah. I was just too close to dread. I uh, held the character and the old stories in too much reverence and couldn't come up with anything interesting to say. It's still... I'm still enormously grateful to John for giving me the opportunity, but creatively for me, it was a dead end. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, where does, where does DC and Karen Berger and Vertigo come in at this point? Our uh, so Karen is one of the other people who've noticed trouble souls. Yes. Um, it's reprinted in a graphic novel. Uh, towards the end of 89, I think. Um, and it's, it's quite a nice package. It's a, it's a 90 page full color graphic novel with a full color cover. And it's a pretty good portfolio to hand out to people in a way. I mean, it's not, obviously it's not a portfolio in the classic sense, but it's me showing what I can do, how I can tell a story. And I think I handed Karen a copy at the Angoulême convention in France in January of 1990. It was British comics year uh, at Angoulême that year. And so John Wagner, Alan Moore, Pat Mills, Steve McManus, Cam Kennedy, myself, Warren Police, a few of the younger guys, Brendan McCarthy, Grant Morrison, Pete Milligan. I mean, if that train had derailed, history would be very different. Sure. But... Um, that was where I met Karen. Obviously, she didn't know me from Adam. I was just some kid from British Comics, but I do think I gave her a copy of the Troubled Souls book, um, or she got a, her hands on it one way or another. And not long after that, I got a call uh, asking if I wanted to take over, I wanted to pitch to take over Hellblazer from Jamie Delano. Okay. Yeah, because so my, my memory at the time was that it was nearly impossible to actually get the British comics over in the States. Right. But that, but that crisis had a really, really good rep. Um, and, and so we were all trying to bring the book in. Right. And, and the troubled souls was one of the stories in there that really actually stood out to us. Now you, you say you don't think it's very good these days, but it was again, different than anything that we had yeah. read before. You know, yeah. and that, that's really the key part of it, you know, um, oh, not absolutely. just in terms yeah. of uh, uh, showing us things that we hadn't seen, but also in terms of the dialogue and in terms of the way the characters interacted yeah. Yeah. almost exclusively through conversation and dialogue right. as opposed to action. You know, right. there's not absolutely. a lot of action in Troubled Souls, right? There's not yeah, a lot of explosions. And I think there's like two instances of violence maybe three something like right. mostly people chatting to one another uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, although i am not fond of it i'm not blind to its impact i i understand how far down the path it got me yeah, yeah. definitely yeah and so uh and i remember i remember seeing that collected edition uh or bringing it in because you know 89 was the same time i opened my store um right, right. Uh, the collected edition of Troubled Souls, and it was it was really different than any of the other graphic novels that we had because it was like printed on shiny paper. It was, you know, it was a, a pretty um, a sophisticated package, I guess. You know, I think, um, so. I think so, and I think also that <clears throat> Crisis, although it was sized uh, more at American, uh, sorry, more at British comics dimensions, yeah. the actual dimensions. Where there was of American comics, so you could shrink the pages, 
by a little bit and you'd have something that could fit on American comic store shelves. That was a deliberate decision. So when the book comes out, there it is. It's tailor made for the American market. Yeah. 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 No, it, I mean, it's, it's interesting because it really seemed, uh, it really seemed like a prestige product in, in a yeah. lot of ways, you know? Yeah, they did a nice um, job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, Vertigo hadn't started yet. No. no. Yeah, at that point. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, this was, yeah, this was pre- the, the, your your first issue. Am I wrong that your first issues of Hellblazer were the in the Vertigo launch, or were you no. like? No, it was about half. It was it was about halfway through my run. Okay. Um, okay. My first issue was forty one, and I think that was in early nineteen ninety one. Yeah. And the first Vertigo issues were in was it February of ninety three? I think yeah. I can remember Karen talking to me at the San Diego con in the summer of 92 and showing me the first uh, vertical material, really, yeah. you know, logos, uh, mocked up covers, had that stripe down the side, if you remember that. Yeah, I do uh, remember. <laughs> yeah, I remember that stripe, yep. Yeah, the vertigo stripe. Mm -hmm. And she told me from now on, um, her books were going to be, they were already kind of grouped together. You know, she had yeah. her... Her, her own kind of editorial corner. But from then on, and uh, I mean, this had been planned for some time. Everyone knew this was going to happen. It would be, uh, it would be its own imprint. It was going to be called Vertigo and it would kick off the following February. Um, yeah. And that was, I think, uh, I think that was issue 63. And that would have been about roughly halfway through my run. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so you weren't being he head hunted for Vertigo specifically, but you were you were part of this kind of British invasion, I guess. Yeah. Uh, is is yeah. um, did you did you feel like um, you had to do something to stand out within that, or was it just we're all part of this wave and it's working out and it's cool? I'm just trying to kind of get into people's head spaces yeah. at, at that point. Sure. I mean, at that point, uh, this does sound a little slick, but there was, there was a real perception that what you did at that time, if you were a British comic writer, you started out working for 2000 AD or similar on short stories. You got a regular strip, then the Americans noticed you, and they give you maybe a mini series to prove yourself on or in at the deep end with a monthly. Yeah. And the next thing you knew, you were kind of on the same path that Alan Moore had blazed, um, yeah. or trail that he blazed, I should say. I mean, Grant had done it. Uh, mm -hmm. Pete Milligan had done it. Jamie Delano as well. Uh, Neil, obviously. Everyone, although, um, uh, let's see, Jamie and Neil didn't do a great deal of work for 2000. They did a little bit. Um, Grant and Pete were absolute 2000 AD veterans with Zenith and Bad Company. Yep. And so this this really was the perception. Um, this was the path that uh, I figured I would follow. Mark Miller was the same. Warren Ellis was the same. Um, you know, more or less by hook or by crook, that, that was how we did it. Sure. So, uh, I mean, if, and, and this is a stupid fucking analogy, but if, if Alan Moore was the Beatles... Uh, your Herman and the Hermits. I mean, I, I, I uh, ten years later. Yeah. So somebody in the seventies, anyway. Okay. All right. Um, did you feel like you had to uh, sort of approach the path the same way, or or had enough time pass that 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 your wave was its own thing? Um. I felt, regardless of what anyone else had done or what I was a part of or anything, I felt that I had to hit the ground running. Yeah. Uh, I had to make some kind of a splash, yeah. um, do something fairly radical to get noticed, hence Constantine finding out he's got terminal lung cancer in the first issue. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the second one I did where he tricks the devil into drinking magic Guinness, yeah. that was the issue I wrote as a tryout. And that was the one that effectively got me the job. 
um, what happened was uh, Karen asked me and a couple of other people, uh, Mark Miller, and a guy called John Smith. Do you remember John Smith? He, I do remember John Smith, yeah. Yeah, he worked for Crisis. He did that Scarab Mini for Vertigo. Yep. He, she invited us to, I think it was just the three of us, and she invited us to, to write one-off issues uh, as pitches to get the regular job. And uh, she then immediately handed over to her new hire, Stuart Moore, and said, you're the new editor here. You choose the new Hellblazer writer, and you carry on from there. So Stuart's like, thanks. And um, he... Uh, as I recall, he he took a little while to decide. Um, not that I begrudge him that, you know, because he's learning as he's going along, just like I am. I I do remember that during the process of deciding, he offered me Doctor Fate. Huh. You know, you know the guy with a yellow bucket on his head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember thinking, oh shit, what do I do now? Do I say yes and end up writing this terrible character? Is this has he already decided to give the book to someone else? Give Hellblazer to someone else, and this is my sort of booby prize uh, or, or consolation prize, I suppose. But what do I do? This is my first contact, essentially, with an American publisher, and if I turn this down, will it look bad? On the other hand, can I really write this blue and yellow idiot with the thing on his head? And, and caught on the horn of the dilemma, I said to Stuart, I'm sorry, I can't do it. And we didn't know each other at this point, but you don't have to talk to Stuart for very long before you realize what a reasonable, decent guy he is. And he said, no, I didn't think you would, but... I, I need someone to write it, and I, I just thought I'd try. Uh, and then not long after that, happy ending, uh, Hellblazer was mine. Yeah, interesting. Um, uh, a, a quick time out just for a second and just remind all of the people who are viewing, um, if you have questions for Garth, uh, we're not going to answer, answer them, ask them yet, but if you'd like to get them in the queue and, uh, and start asking questions, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get that answered, uh, for you in a bit. Um, so Hellblazer, um, so you come in at 41 and, right. and I mean, the character has been firmly established at that point, yeah. right? Um, Very much so. Yeah, I mean, D Delano was on it for what two years? I want to say, give or take. Uh, he did the first forty issues. Oh, did he? Did he do the whole thing? Okay, all right. He I don't. Did. Yeah, uh, there were. Needle did a fill in. Yeah, and uh, Grant did two issues, and I think yeah, there was yeah, another yeah. one by Dick Foreman. But apart okay. from that, he did the lot. So you were the you were the the second regular writer on the book. Then. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and so was that um, at all daunting? Um, it was a bit, and that goes back to my intention to hit the ground running and make a big splash because I'm aware that uh, coming onto the book after such a successful run as Jamie's, I'm, I'm really going to have to establish myself fast. I mean, this isn't quite Rick Veach to Alan Moore, but that doesn't mean that I'm not very, very impressed by Jamie's work. Uh, yeah. I love it to this day. As a matter of fact, yeah. um, and I understand there's there's a certain burden to be carried here. Um, they sent me this. This is maybe of interest. They sent me uh, Jamie's last script to read because at that point it hadn't been drawn. It was the one that Dave McKean drew. Yeah. And Jamie, without meaning to, taught me an absolutely vital lesson. I, I read his script. And the introduction to the script went something like, well, he told you what was going to happen. He told you that Constantine having a kind of spiritual, mental, and magical breakdown was going to travel to another world and meet his alternate version, who was a magus, who was, instead of a broken, alcoholic mess, uh, as our Constantine was, was, in fact, a massively successful master magician who had succeeded in uh, saving the little girl during the Newcastle exorcism. And therefore, after that, everything else had worked out properly for him. Um, and Constantine, our Constantine, would meet his more successful self 
And Jamie said, now this more successful Constantine is probably the one that mo most people would have preferred to have read about. Yeah. And that hit me right between the eyes because I thought, my God, he knew all along that he could have written a more commercially acceptable follow-up to what Alan Moore had done. He could have done the wisecracking, lighthearted, good-natured rogue who occasionally appears out of the shadows, says something brilliant, disappears again. He could have gone no further than that, but instead he picked up on other aspects of what Alan had created. He picked up on the guy who was prepared to sacrifice people for whatever job he was doing, whatever mission he was on. Uh, and he picked up on what the human cost would be to Constantine, spiritually, mentally. Um, but what I learned from that was he knew he could have done something more successful, more commercially successful, but he had no interest in it. And he stuck with what he wanted to do and what meant the most to him creatively. And that was a vital lesson. And it was one I've never forgotten, actually. Um, don't do the obvious. Don't do what seems like uh, the big payday uh, way to go. Don't do that. Do what feels right to you. So thank you to Jamie for teaching me that lesson early on. Yeah, yeah, no, very much so. Um... Very much so. Um, you did two things with with uh, Hellblazer that I, I you know, I, I think we're out of left field in a way. Um, one was you started aging in real time. He he had right. his fortieth birthday, and then right. and then he got old, and he he was facing his mor mortality. And this was not a thing that you ever saw in comics. Everybody, you know. Like it, 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 the Alan Moore uh, uh, Hellblazer is he's 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 Sting forever young kind of right. you know um, right. uh, what was your thinking there uh, for for doing that for for grounding him in that reality where you are aging and it matters and things go forward. I, I should be honest and say that actually at that point I am again following Jamie's lead because early on in Jamie's run, I think about issue 9 or 10, Constantine finds himself practically homeless, staggering into a bar somewhere in, a, in a, an American city yeah. uh, where the plot has taken him at this point and he happens to mention that it's his 36th birthday. Mm. And he says something like, I'm 36 years old and totally shot to hell. So Jamie had actually uh, flicked that domino over. I was just following on from him, really. But it seemed like the natural thing to do. I mean, the, the 40th birthday party was a fun issue. Um, it's one of, one of the many aspects of Hellblazer, I think, that sets it apart from, from other comics and other characters. It's, it's a, a regular guy, an ordinary guy. Yes, he is... He knows magic. Sure. That's true. But in every other aspect of his life, he's like you and me. He's like anybody else. Uh, he suffers through the same frustrations. Um, he's subject to the same occasionally deeply unpleasant problems. Of course, what, what you're doing here is you're kind of writing yourself or the next guy into a corner. And I'm pretty sure that I think Hellblazer ran for 300 issues. I I doubt he was 60 by the end of it. Yeah, I actually, I actually feel like he was by the end of it. I, I maybe I'm wrong that? about that. I, I think that they did like acknowledge that at some point. Right. Uh, right. You know. It would have, yeah. It would have been Pete Milligan by the end. So fair play to Pete. Yeah. He would. Yeah. Have been yeah. Able to yeah. yeah. Well, especially because you know American comics. I mean. Clark, Ken, and Bruce Wayne are 29 forever. forever. <laughs> They're always 29, you know? Uh, and so, um, yeah, for, for John to turn 40 and then that be an actual thing, yeah. Was, yeah. Was, it, was, it, was, it was revelatory in a way that shouldn't be because it's so banal, yeah. you know? Yeah. I know what you mean. It's, it's possibly, again, that hubris creeping in or, or again, just ignorance because it's like, mm. oh, you don't do this in American comics? Oh, I had no idea. Yeah. Is is there is there a much of a difference between ignorance and hubris? 
<laughs> Whatever gets the job done. <laughs> That's what I would say. The second thing that you did with Hellblazer, which, you know, I thought was, um, you know, incredibly different and made the book a very special book was you, you almost turned it into a romance comic. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 the introduction of Kit, uh, and it became very much about real relationships with real people who were not these kind of idealized figures who are, do you know what I mean? Like, 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 like. Lois Lane or whatever is like a perfect woman yeah, who yeah. doesn't have problems and there's never conflict. It, it's, it's almost, it's almost, you know, like, like how Star Trek was with relationships, right? No yeah. characters ever have conflicts with one another, but, but John and Kit, I mean, it was all about the conflict. It was everything about the conflict. So, um, uh, one, where did that come from for you? And two, did you get any pushback from that? Um, second one first. No, I got no pushback. People were people were very happy with it. As for where it came from, I, Jamie had established Constantine in a couple of relationships, but they were sort of on off. Um, Kit, in a way, may have been just a a more detailed expression of what of what Jamie had established. Where Constantine gets involved with women who realize he's bad news, but are attracted to him anyway. Uh, I think Kit had the good sense. Maybe this is what set her apart. Kit had the good sense to realize if I stick with this guy, I'm gonna die. Yeah. Um, he's bad news. The way all bad boys are bad news, but but this could be a step further. This could be the end of my life. I mean, it doesn't stop her coming back at the end of the book just to sort of dot the I's and cross the T's, take care of unfinished business, and they have that last night together. But after that, as far as Constantine's concerned, she she's not coming back. She's got the good sense to stay away from him, and that's going to that's gonna be... He's going to have to understand that that's his curse. The girl he really wants is wise to him and isn't going to throw her life, quite literally throw her life away on him. Sure. I just... I guess part of the question I'm asking is, is there... Was there a conscious move on your part of like, maybe we don't need to talk about just sort of the nonsense of magic and, 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 you know, <laughs> devil's blood and, right. and, you right. know, the, you know what I mean? Like, and actually exactly. ground things in a real reality yeah. of human beings. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, one of my, probably my all time favorite Hellblazer story is Jamie's Family Man. Mm. Six parter, which comes about halfway yeah. through his run, and in that there is almost no magic at all. The only thing that happens is I think at one point he he does some trick where he waves a compass over a map or something and kind of gets a fix on the guy he's looking for. Apart from that, it's a straightforward crime story about a guy hunting a serial killer, and of course ends up getting hunted back. Um, it's my it's my favorite of Jamie's run. It's probably my favorite Hellblazer story. Um, but yes, I mean I I'm not really interested in the mumbo jumbo. Maybe maybe this is the inner atheist coming out here in me. But I can remember maybe you remember at the time that Warren Ellis was writing um, a book. Was it Son of Satan or Hellstorm? Yeah, Hellstorm. Yeah, mm -hmm. for Marvel, right? Yep. And he was writing that at the time and. I'm writing Hellblazer, and Warren goes out, he told me, and he bought grimoires and practical guides to magic and histories of Wicca and, you know, the, the Necronomicon, various things like this. And he's got this big pile of books for research, and I buy, it's not even a book, it's a pamphlet, it's called Bluff Your Way in the Occult. And... That's my Hellblazer research. Um, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned, it's all bollocks anyway, so why not make it up? Sure. You know? Yeah. No, that, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, uh, all right, so uh, atheism. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about Preacher. Ooh. There's a segue. <laughs> Good idea. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, uh, and, and so, um, and so I guess then, where did Preacher come from? What, what it, uh, it, it's a it's a melange of a lot of things. Where it's where did amazing. you where where did you how how did you pitch this? Um, Preacher came about essentially because once Steve Dillon uh, had come on board Hellblazer as yeah. regular artist, and he and I had become uh, a successful team. I think mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Vertigo wanted to see what we'd do next, and they essentially said, "We'll take whatever you whatever creator own book you want to do next." And so in practical terms, that's where Preacher came from. And I spent, I suppose, from late 93 to mid 94, when I started actually writing it, coming up with Preacher. Um, and talk about blundering your way down the path, my goodness. Uh, I had a vague sense that I wanted it to be an American story. Um, you can see it's kind of vertigo trappings in a way because there are angels and demons in there, heaven and sure, hell are sure. places you can visit. But I think it's a very American story and it's a very movie-inspired story. Like, like a lot of my stuff, it doesn't come from other comics, not really. It comes from movies. Um, in this case, most obviously, uh, Wild at Heart, uh, the romance, uh, the, the, the lovers who'll do anything for each other. You know, their romance will set the world on fire. Um, near Dark, the kind of realistic, down and dirty treatment of vampires. Uh, and of course, Unforgiven, uh, where you have this, the Old West personified in this mythical gunfighter who steps directly out of history, uh, Walker Colts blazing, and uh, will not go away. Um, that's essentially where Preacher comes from. That's the starting point. Of course, you know, at the time, I'm just stumbling from one idea to another, slowly gluing them onto this this central notion. Uh, it takes a while to come up with the name Preacher. It takes a while to come up with the names of the lead characters. I knew I wanted to be a Western, but a contemporary one. I knew I wanted to be a heavily American story. I know I want there to be a lot of movie style action in it. That's more or less where we started. So, um, uh, had you had you spent much time in America at that point? Um, let's see. I first came to New York in '92. Spent most of that spring, summer, and fall here, um, and had then visited on and off. Uh, two or three times a year in the, the intervening period. Uh, so when I started to pull Preacher together, I really only had a sort of few months experience of the country, uh, of actually being in the country. Culturally, of course, I'd been exposed to uh, America since I was a kid. Sure. So, so why do you think uh, that, and, and, and again, probably the answer is hubris, but why do you think as a... Uh, a young man from a small town in Ireland that you can comment on America, that, that you understand America, you know? Yeah. Um, it's probably because for, for me, America was love at first sight. And it's pro at the time, I'm probably not thinking in terms of uh, having the arrogance to comment on a nation that isn't mine so much as offering this thing to a place and a culture that I've that I've fallen in love with, that I, in a way I've always loved yeah. since I started watching movies as a little kid. Yeah, I I uh, I, I just I, I you're you're almost the most American guy I know, Garth. Is <laughs> is, is the craziest thing, you know? Um, your 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 love for this country, uh, or at least at least the potential for the country maybe mm. not what the country actually is in fact i think you see all the hypocrisies and horror of of what america tries to fool itself that it, that it is oh sure um, i mean my idealism's taken a few knocks recently <laughs> oh yes I can tell you that. yeah but i've i've grown up at this point i've grown up with american culture in terms of tv and movies and not comics funnily enough 
uh, at, at least only comparatively recently, uh, and a good deal of prose fiction as well. Um, there's there's something else at play here too, which is um, the Second World War experience of the country, knowing that in the UK, you're growing up in a nation that was essentially saved and preserved by American sacrifice. That, not that I, I was necessarily putting it this way in 1992, but sure. that had it not been for Americans in the Second World War, Britain would be under either a Nazi or a Soviet jackboot. And, and, and do you, do you feel that as much, uh, being Irish? Because certainly, I mean, I think that someone who's in London or, or the main part of, of England as an Englander would feel that, but uh, I don't know a lot about how, how the Irish cultural experience would be. Uh, well, you must remember that I'm from Northern Ireland, which is yeah. to all intents and purposes, British territory. Yes. And depending on which community you come from and which tradition you're a part of uh you, you feel either british or irish uh for me it's the british half of things um i've grown up very much on british comics especially on british war comics um i'm familiar with a, a great deal of british culture and history and so that's the one i tend to respond to okay uh now in terms of how an Irish person might feel, if you're talking about an Irish person from the north or an Irish person from the south, which is a separate country and not part of the UK, um, that's where it gets interesting. Um, I think if you were a southern Irish citizen, you would at least have to acknowledge that had Britain gone under in the Second World War, uh, that Ireland would have been snapped up like a morsel not long yeah. afterwards. Um, and that had it not been for the American intervention that um, saves not only Britain, uh, but also a good chunk of Western Europe, Ireland too, would have ended up in dire straits. Yeah. I, I should qualify that slightly. There is one thing I should say. Britain was capable of maintaining itself, preserving itself. Yeah. Uh, but it was not capable of launching an invasion on its own that liberated and redeemed a good chunk of Western Europe. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that took I, America. I, yeah. Let me, um, I actually feel like I should turn to some questions because there's a lot of them stacking up now. Sure. Uh, can you scroll me back to the, to the, Oh, is that the oldest? Oh, you're going to throw them up. Jordan's going to throw them up. Uh, Pudrigo, when writing preacher, did you feel more like a guide or a companion to the characters? <laughs> um, Interesting. Pro probably a bit of both. At a certain, you want them to do certain things. You push them in certain ways, but you know they're going to jump in their own particular directions. Um, you know that there are things you can't believably get the characters to do. Um, probably the character that took the biggest left turn was Cassidy, um, because I knew all along that there was something quite nasty lurking in his past. Um, largely uh, built on my own suspicions that I developed about people I knew in real life who were like that, who were lovable rogues. Uh, there was a there was a bit of my experience on writing Constantine and Hellblazer fed into that as well. So I knew I was going to reveal something about Cassidy that maybe a lot of people wouldn't like. But you know, again, you go the way you want to go, not not the commercially successful way. So, honest answer is, I suppose, a bit of both. Uh, yeah. You start out by guiding them, and then sometimes you just sit back and watch them do their thing. Yeah. I, um, it, it was interesting to me with Cassidy because, um, uh, in a way, I, I would call you an Irish nationalist in terms of what, had, what your content had been mm -hmm. up to that point. <clears throat> um, and so casting Cass as a villain uh or relatively a villain is it was a what was a very unique thing for a creator to do mm. um 
As far as Cassidy is concerned, if, if you look at his experience in the the Easter Rising in 1916, where where he effectively has his his well his rebirth comes immediately after it. But when you look at the experience he and uh, his brother have, where the brother at least realizes that the two of them have been trotted out as a blood sacrifice and they did no better as Irish rebels than they would have done in the British army on the Western Front fighting the Germans. Um, Cassidy has essentially turned his back on Irish nationalism, on, on Irish politics. He enjoys being Irish. He enjoys a bit of Blarney. He enjoys playing it up for the girls. Uh, there are advantages to be had there. But in terms of his Irishness, it's not as important to the character as what he essentially is, which is a 16-year-old kid handed unimaginable power at just the wrong time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and for our American audiences, what is his brother's name? How is it pronounced in, in America? Oh, not in America. How is it pronounced? Uh, well, his, his brother's name, I think, is Billy or something, but you mean Cassidy himself. It's uh, Pronchus. Oh, yeah, I do mean Cassidy himself. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. It's Pronchus, yeah. which I believe is... Pronchus. Yeah, Pronchus. Shus, Pronchus, okay. And I think it's actually Francis, so it's technically Frank. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, that's that's cool. I I learned something new. I uh, think got, I'm right about that. Yeah. Uh, next, yeah. Uh, from Seth. Hi, Seth, buddy. What's going on, man? Uh, given the way that America has become louder about its religiosity since Preacher was first published, would you change anything about the story if you were writing it today? Hmm. Um. I'm not sure I would change anything about that aspect of it. You, you might see uh, a few more people dragged through the mud, but the notion of um, right-wing evangelistic American preaching uh, was something I was very familiar with at the time. Um, and of course, as an atheist, responded very negatively to So I'm not sure that that aspect of the story would be all that different. Yeah, I, uh, I, you know, I reread the book uh, this morning just to, to reprep myself. Um, and uh, one of the things that struck me today, this moment in time is, man, there's a whole lot of N words and, yeah. and F words. And um, I think what uh, uh, some people would present as really calcified notions of how people should deal with one another um i'm mm. in no way putting that on you because i think you're writing characters and those characters are true characters but would that aspect of it change today would you would you you know would hugo root be talking about martian n-words yeah. you know yeah. that is a good question i i mean if you, if you look at at those particular scenes uh, that that is obviously being played for laughs. It's absolute grotesquery. Uh, it's the man is clearly mad as well as yeah. wrong and evil. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that kind of thing would fly today yeah. uh, in the current climate. Um, generally, what I would say is the people who use those words in the book come to sticky ends. Sure. Uh, Hugo has a very sticky hand, as I recall. And of course, Hugo is not just a shit. He's a miserable shit because he lives with our face and he's got yeah. that literally in his face every day, every hour of every day of his life. Uh, so he does suffer for the, the evil that he propagates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know where else to go with that. I, I just, I, I, I wonder if, I actually wonder uh, if these issues would have been published today. Like yeah. With yeah. the script as it is. I, I, I almost feel like um, somebody would have been all, no, you, no, no, you can't do that. Oh my God, yeah. no, you can't do that. Um, when, it's very when, difficult to say. Uh, I mean, the, the trouble with, you know, what would happen to Preacher today is... Yeah. You start tugging on that thread and the whole thing unravels because it is yeah. it is very much um, a product of its time. If I was to write a book today, 
uh, where you had that kind of language, it would probably be a lot darker, a lot more serious. There wouldn't be Hugo and his Martians, for instance. Sure. Um, and the people who were using that language would probably come to even stickier ends. Yeah. What's what's the line between uh, uh, humor and horror? I suppose. Um. Yeah, uh, you know it when you when you trip over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it's uh, you know that, that one humor and horror, and when you stop laughing and just find yourself appalled. My goodness, that's different for almost everyone. Sure. sure. That's what that's where I I partic I don't like making rules for writing anyway, but that's yeah. where that's where I would hate to come up with some sort of catch all rule. Uh because I, I think you would run into all kinds of problems and people once you make a rule, people start trying to figure way runs figure ways sure. runs anyway. So Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh we got another. Yeah. Uh Juan Perez Ber Bermejo. What is it with all of the what is with all the face mutilation disfiguring in Preacher? Was it just cool looking or did something move you in this direction? Um, let's see. Generally, it was just it was just something a bit different. I think Tulip shoots a fella's jaw off in the first issue. No, I'm not sure where I got the idea to do that, but it might just have been let's let's throw in a visual that people aren't expecting. When it comes to Arseface in particular, well, there are, there are people who've done that. Uh, there are people who, as Dennis Leary put it, failed to get their whole head in front of the shotgun, and that's what's resulted. And to me, having seen one in particular of, of these people stumbling and drooling and dribbling and moaning on TV, it was really just a question of how can I not make that into a character? And beyond that, maybe, maybe as, as the chap said, maybe it was just cool looking. I, I can't off the top of my head think of any other particular examples, but Arseface being the most obvious one, um, that I think was, it, it was just too good not to do. Yeah. I, um, I like Arseface. I, I, I mean, I like him because he's the only character in the book who, seems untouched by horror and, yeah. and and the doom that's around him and he he maintains even though he vows vengeance against jesse or whatever yeah at yeah. the end of the first arc he's he's still he believes in things and he he's that, a that's, decent little guy he's a decent little guy yeah yeah he really is i mean before he shot his face off he was just some teenage prick that's yeah. all he was. Then he shot his face off and he became the all American kid. Then his dad died and he thought he had to swear vengeance. But in actual fact, he, he, he ends up pointing a gun at the guy he thinks he has to kill. And Jesse just quietly explains to him if you think about it, if you think about who your dad was and you think about why I did what I did and you think about some of the other things your dad had done, yeah. maybe you don't want to be pointing that gun at me. And then after that, Arseface, we're free to really sort of have Arseface as a sort of adorable figure of fun. Yeah, yeah. And this is the thing to me that I that I appreciate the most about Preacher is that uh, uh, it is gory and it is horrible and there is doom and there's all of these just fucked up things that happened but at the core of it there's there's always a very real morality that touches me as much as as you know with great power comes great responsibility did right. when i was eight years old right? right like it's a different kind of thing but it's it's that that you have to care for other people even in the face of horror and doom and yeah. um that strikes me perhaps uh and perhaps and foolishly as a very american thing um, um possibly i i think it's i think it's more of really just a human thing yeah um but ultimately i would say that with all the with all the carnage blood and horror that you've that you've talked about preacher 
Preacher has enough heart to get it through, I think. It has heart. Um, a lot of people didn't like it for a variety of reasons, but I think the people who did like it responded... <laughs> Responded, Sorry. <laughs> uh, res responded to that kind of streak of, dare I say, kindness that is running through this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We, no, we and, haven't and, actually we haven't actually mentioned Steve Dillon yet. In the, we in haven't, the and the yeah, and I, I should I should do that, and I, and I should say it it helps enormously to have an artist of his brilliance and his consistency who could create characters that were so human and keep them so. Uh, yeah. That was absolutely vital. It would not have worked without that man. Yeah, yeah. And okay, so um, uh, let's let's go back to that. He, he was involved from <clears throat> the start here, yes? Yes, he was. Yeah. yeah. Because, so, um, because of our, our sort of success in, 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 in the Hellblazer, second yeah. half of my, yeah, yeah. my run on Hellblazer, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so was this um, was this literally a sequence of weeks in a bar you guys just talking shit out <laughs> do you know it's funny because if if you had overheard any of what the, the the few instances that might have passed for preacher development sessions they would have gone something like this and i won't attempt his accent but it would have been something like so how's it coming oh not bad should have something soon oh great okay that's it. That that's a preacher development plotting <laughs> session right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. People people are always taken aback by this, but it, it's very simple. I wrote it and he drew it, and each of us trusted the other uh, to give them exactly what he wanted. Yeah, that's that's hard though, isn't it? Isn't it hard to trust someone that much? Um, that doesn't strike me as the way the comics are produced a lot of the time. Um, I, I've been fortunate to find that many times, actually, or, or at yeah. least several times. Um, with Steve and myself, yeah, we, we, we didn't exactly hit the ground running, I would say, because we did some other stuff together, um, a couple of Judge Dredd stories and a couple of fill-in Hellblazer issues that he did where I didn't do a particularly good job, but once we started working together regularly, we did build up a head of steam. And being able to trust each other like that, developing a relationship like that, it's, it's absolutely invaluable. As I say, I have found it with other people. Um, John McRae, Russ Braun, uh, Jason Burroughs, Yep. Uh, people like Goran Parlov and Goran Suzuka more recently, PJ Holden, where I suppose it's some sort of creative equivalent of finishing each other's sentences, yeah. uh, but it's invaluable. And when you don't have it, you notice the difference pretty bloody quickly, I can tell you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we have another cue here, my friend. Similar to the combo, Rio, the RE, the relationship in Hellblazer, how do you determine the complex dynamics between characters like Jesse, Tulip, and Cassidy? Are these based on real people? Um, no. No, they are not. Uh, I mean, there may be the occasional line here, the occasional scene uh, that are based on things I've seen or done, uh, but they are all, to some extent or another, uh larger than life um cassidy is the irish rogue via the vampires of near dark um jesse's the all-american boy uh tulip visually at least was based on on parallel's character in nikita uh i think released here as la femme nikita yeah. um the luke besson film from the early 90s um she and Jesse actually are, their relationship at least is inspired by um, the uh, Nicolas Cage and Laura Dern characters from World Wild at Heart, um, as I mentioned earlier. So these are, these are larger than life characters. These aren't necessarily realistic. Uh, if, if their relationships, if certain aspects of their relationships strike people as uh, as ringing true, I'm very glad to hear it, but they are not really based in reality. So some aspects of their behavior 
uh, particularly Cassidy when he starts to go off the rails, are based on things that I've witnessed. Uh, but beyond that, no, they're they're off the screen. They're from the movies. Yeah. How much? Uh, how much of the arcs of these characters did you have in mind when you started? Like, oh. did you know that Cassidy was going to betray in that way, or or that he would betray at all? Um, I can't remember exactly when uh, when I figured that out, but I, I would say that I. I got a sense of where the characters were going to go very early on, like maybe maybe in the first six months to a year. And I got a sense of where the story was going to go and how everything was going to turn out by the end of the second year. How much of the background was already in place, though, at that point? I mean, how, how much of Jesse's background in Anvil did you know? Um, that one, <laughs> that's my favorite part of the whole thing by the way the anvil storyline um that one I, I knew some aspects of it but that was that essentially wrote itself at that point i was so into what i was doing and i was enjoying myself so much and the first six or seven issues of the book had gone over well enough and the thing was starting to take on a life of its own and seals were rising and i thought I'm I'm onto something here. If I can just channel whatever weird elemental sense of things I've accidentally tapped into and just keep keep adding little bits to the madness, I'll be all right. So it was it was stuff like Jody. Let's put Jody in. Let's have the man monster, the guy that can't be stopped. And let's give him a horrible, scully little sidekick. And then let's have this this horrible down on the farm shit with with a, a sort of injection of a clan in there. Yeah. And let's let's put the little kid in the coffin. Yeah. That's that's fucked up and horrible beyond all description and imagination. So let's put that in there too. I think that'll work. Doesn't sound very likely, but it's in it fits the tone of what we're doing here. It was like that. It was yeah. like, let's just keep adding bits. Yeah. Um, and, and that one maybe worked out better than any of the others. I don't know. Okay. Um, the, uh, the, the, the critical response at the time, I mean, my, my memory too, is that we all read this and we went, holy shit, this is different than what we've read before. We, I, I want more of this. Um, did, yeah. Yeah. did, did that reaction to the work, change the work um in to the extent that as i described i had a sense that oh this is working this is actually working you know it, it wasn't up to then it had maybe been uh, sort of stumbling in the dark to an extent and just adding things and realizing oh this is working and after that it became let's add things because you're onto something here because because this is going, not it's working, but this is going to continue to work. Um, so there was, confidence was building at yeah. this point, and that okay. helped enormously. As, as I recall, what happened was it launched, did okay, sales started to slip, and then about halfway through the, the first year, the thing started to take on a life of its own. There were... There was a bit of a fuss. Some people complained. Other people defended it tooth and nail. And all of a sudden, it, the the reputation of the book developed a life of its own. Yeah. And so, by yeah. the end of that first year, it had gotten, in terms of sales, it had gotten way back up beyond what we'd launched at. Mm -hmm. Everyone was very pleased, and. Um, and, and things were almost set in stone at that point. Um, we, we, were, we were all of us on the book confident enough to just carry on with what seemed right, what seemed yeah. to be working. Yeah. The, um, did, did you, was it pitched as a mini originally? No. Because, no, it was oh, no, okay. Because, I mean, certainly I feel like, I feel like issue four comes to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. That if that if you could that if you needed to walk away you could walk away at that point. Um, 
I think that might just have been because there was no need to walk away at that point, but it was just, it was just, my God, I better stop this somewhere and, and take the book somewhere else because this, this has been pretty crazy. You know, a guy just sodomized himself with his own severed genitalia and, yep. and God, arse face and the saint of killers and angels and, and Cassidy and oh my God. And I'd better draw a line under this and change the location a bit and establish that. Um, oh, this is, of course, this is something I forgot to mention earlier. One of the things I decided early on, an aspect of it being an American story, it was going to be a road trip. A road trip, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Absolutely. I needed to move on fast and, and establish that. Yeah. No, and America is a road trip, right? Because America is not, there is no America. There's no such thing as America. America, there's 50 different Americas uh, times 5,000 right mm -hmm. like no there, you, you can't even like each state is different than it within one another uh america is the road in a way that's true that's true but america is all those americas uh, this is one of those metaphors we're going to beat to death if we're not yeah. careful but yeah, yeah but yes you know there are many many american experiences and i wanted to try to get as many as possible into the book hence the hence the probably juddering stop at the end of book uh, issue four yeah all right another cue yeah what drove you to make cassidy a vampire in a story that is otherwise about christian mythology probably because i didn't know it wouldn't fit christian mythology <laughs> um it, you must remember that that again <laughs> this is the this is the atheist experience here um, when it comes to Christian mythology and so on, to me, it's just mumbo jumbo. It's just yep. cool looking special effects. That's all it is. So if you're telling me there's a guy who can be nailed to a cross, asphyxiate, and then come back to life, to me, that's, that's right up there with vampires anyway. Like, shit, why not have some dragons? Um, so it's not, it's not really a serious attempt at a study of christian theology or mythology it's it's looking for cool looking special effects yeah yeah uh how much uh research did you do uh into christian mythology into the bible did you read the bible uh, cover to cover for this story did you do you care it was more it was more my upbringing uh and, and my turning against Christianity in particular and religion in general. Um, there's a scene in the book where Grandma tells Jesse about God for the first time. And she says, she talks about a special person who lives inside your heart, who can see everything you do, who at the same time is all powerful and lives in heaven and will judge, punish, or reward you as necessary. Um, isn't that lovely, Jesse? Isn't that wonderful? And Jesse says, no, Grandma, it's kind of scary. And she hits him. Now, apart from getting hit, that's exactly what happened to me. Um, because my parents aren't remotely religious, I first encountered religion in school at the age of five or six. And I, I lifted Jesse's scene, apart from getting hit, you know, from my own experience, which was the teacher telling the class about God. Everyone else has been primed, of course, because their their parents are religious and I've told them about God. And in the schoolyard, it's, I love God, do you love God? Yes, I love God, yes, yes, I love God. What about you, do you love God? Yes, I love God. And they ask me and I go, uh, no, I hate him. What I mean is I'm terrified, but I, I say I hate him, but actually I'm, I'm terrified out of my wits um i go home i tell my mom about this uh she says what do you think i say uh it sounds stupid meaning i'm terrified uh and she says well there you are then and that was really my introduction to religion to christianity to all of it so i got that scene i was i was able to lift that scene for jesse which was a good one but it kind of sums up my approach, my experience with religion, with Christianity, with, with any of it. Anyway, it's not something to be taken too seriously. It is a lot of nonsense, a lot of mumbo jumbo. So if I'm, if I'm writing a, 
uh, a comic book about it or writing about it at all, I don't feel the need to take it too seriously. Yeah. Well, so, but then why did you want to set uh, uh, the mythology of Preacher around that? Mm -hmm. um, probably because of the, the American aspect of things. Mm. Knowing that how deeply uh, religion is driven into the American experience, uh, what a big part of it Christianity is, especially in the South and especially in the West, uh, and the influence uh, that it has had over people. And remember, I mentioned earlier, uh, I was no stranger to the notion of evangelical right wing Absolutely. Christianity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I have a question, uh, I, and it's in my email. Uh, I have a question here uh, from, from Mr. S. Moore. Um, uh, he I says. Yeah, you might. Uh, he uh, asks, uh, tell us about the importance of the Blarney Stone pub to the mature reader's comic scene of the 1990s. <laughs> I love that question. Well, uh, the Blarney Stone, sadly gone, uh, was on 32nd Street between 6th and 7th, and it was the very first American bar I walked into. Um, Steve Dillon and I went in there. He had been there six years earlier for two weeks and they remembered him uh, and that's more of a comment on steve than it is on uh <laughs> the, the blarney stone of the barman's memory but it sure. was to me it was the perfect pub I, I i loved the way it looked uh i loved the atmosphere i loved where it was everything about it felt just right it was my first american bar and a lot of us did use to drink there um Funny that uh, Stuart mentions it. There was another bar uh, around the corner from DC, and it was just called the Irish Pub. I mean, that was its name. It said on the sign, the Irish Pub. And after after a certain length of time of uh, Stuart and Tom Pyre, who was an editor at Vertigo, or at what would become Vertigo at the time, um, at meeting myself and Steve there, they were they were told, I believe, by the accounts department to please stop submitting uh, expenses requests with places with the word pub in the title. And so what they got into the habit of doing was talking very loudly in the offices about uh, how good the cheeseburger was at the Irish pub mm. or uh, the corned beef sandwich at the Irish pub was the best in town. Of course, it didn't do food at all. Sure, sure. It and all it did was beer forever. Um, but because because this thing developed this larger than life reputation and found its way into the DC accounts department, uh, certain fabrications had to be made so that Stuart and Tom could continue to buy us drinks. There was a lot of that in those days. <laughs> And and do you think that um, uh, that kind of whole scene of because uh, you know Vert Vertigo was the first, but you know Marvel had its own little version, and everybody had their own little version of it. Uh, uh, do you think that that was um, aided and abetted uh, uh, by booze and being in bars? And I think that was just who we were. I mean, you know that yeah. from Steve and I came out to San Francisco. We were happy to prop up whatever bar we found ourselves in. Yeah. It was just what we did. Um, and I suppose there's a distinction here I should make. Neither of us were big American-style drinkers, by which I mean beer and shots, beer and shots, beer and shots all yeah. night. We were just that slow, steady yep. British drinkers um or, or sorry we were from that tradition of british drinkers where you just sit there and slowly and gradually bail pints into you all night but there's no let's do a shot there's no get absolutely out of control absolutely I mean, when, I, when i've tried the alternative it doesn't work but i'm happy to sit at a bar and drink beer all night it's just what works for me yeah um, and the other the other part of it i'll always say about going out with you and steve is it's 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 as much about that as about well everybody has their round you yes, know yes. it's it's um uh, everybody is participating in every it's it's a group thing and that's what makes it so fun mm. it's not the getting drunk the getting drunk is not the point yeah uh, yeah i mean uh, I, I always said that uh, steve certainly liked drinking but what he really liked was the pub 
because yeah. that's where people are. Yeah. And uh, and Steve loved people. He loved to, he would talk to anybody. Yeah. Um, as to you know its effect on comics, it was just what we happened to be doing. Really, it was it was you know how we socialized. Uh, it's worth noting that you know people like Grant Morrison, um, and to an extent, I suppose Pete Milligan and Jamie Delano, although they've been known to enjoy a drink. Uh, weren't quite part of the same drinking culture as we were. Neither were other people at Vertigo. Um, Stuart and Tom were pretty big drinkers, but uh, Shelley Roberg, who became Shelley Bond, Karen herself, uh, were never really a big part of that culture. So yeah, it was really our end of things, to be honest with you. Yeah, but though, though I would find that they would they would stay in the bar all night long. They just they wouldn't be drinking. You know, mm. they'd, they'd be drinking water. You know. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. Anyway, uh, we got another wait, another one from the thing, Jordan. What do we got? Uh, would you be interested to hear how about how your work is influenced by the artist? Would I would be interested to hear about how your work is influenced by the artist you're collaborating with? Yeah, and and so is there a difference between working with Steve or working with John or working with Will or whoever you work with? Mm -hmm. Um, it's generally more a question of. I don't know of a better way to put this, bending the artist to my will <laughs> and, and getting them to kind of deliver what I want. I mean, my scripts are fairly sparse, fairly simple. Uh, it's not like I'm asking for the impossible or for, or for them to follow some incredibly complex set of instructions. Now, that said, the end results are certainly very different. And there's, there's very much a question of what story you choose to give to a particular artist. There are things I would just never give to John. Um, but there were always things that he was absolutely perfect for. Um, but once we're actually working together, it's the, the ideal way of working is just to trust each other so that each of us can get on with his or her job. Yeah, yeah. You, um, you tend to be very dialogue driven. Um, mm -hmm. How do you, when you're writing, do you ever think about the camera and the position of, it, or are you just yeah. thinking about the, 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 the way the characters are speaking to one another? Yeah, you, you will find, if you look at the scripts, uh, and I, I suppose there's, there's been enough reprinted at this point, that I am thinking exactly in those terms. Um, Russ Braun is someone who's extremely good at that, actually. Uh, he responds to that exactly the way I want him because he understands the importance of the establishing shot, the two shot, the close up as the person says the important line or has that little troubled moment. Um, yeah, that, that's definitely that's definitely something where once once we're we're actually up and running and working together, uh, that I will pay attention to. Yeah. Um... And, and then in terms of dialogue, uh, a question I have, uh, and even particularly very much about Preacher, is um, how much of that are you, I guess, acting out uh, as you're putting it on the page? I I'm thinking particularly of Arse Face, and <laughs> it, it strikes me that in order to, to write that twofold dialogue, where it's not just phonetically what he's saying but also mm -hmm. here's the translation that you have to stand there and 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 just do it and go jesse i, think I love you no, 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 no. i think initially i probably did try to speak you know with a maybe the edge of a book between my teeth or something oh, like okay. that mm -hmm. but after that no it became fairly simple you you just think about what's being said and then you you chop out most of the harder uh the harder letters that you're going to put in uh, okay. and reduce the thing to moaning and grunting so it's a mechanical process rather than a pretty much in in our space's case yes it's a yeah. it's a sort of translation if you will yeah um do you uh do you ever thumbnail out your own scripts yourself no just no. just to no no uh, but they're, they're as i say they're pretty sparse they're pretty simple in two cases, and I'm not going to say what, I've had to actually draw my own shitty little mm -hmm. thumbnails of particular panels, but you are literally talking about two panels. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Beyond yeah. that, I've never had to do it, and that's not bad for thirty years. I think. Yeah, no, that seems pretty good. Yeah, but every once in a while, you probably have to check yourself. Of the, uh, I can't ask someone to draw this. You know. No, I usually just go ahead and ask them. <laughs> 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 that's where that's where a lot of the fun comes from. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. All right, uh, give me another question, man. Are you you're cool for time? You're you're still you're give still. Give me one second because I just I just have to top myself up here. Do it. Do it. See, and I'm going to, I'm going to babble for a minute then. Uh, I guess I, cause I have to, I want to thank everybody for being part of this. I want to thank Garth for being part of this. You know, this is, this is a book that, um, it, it meant a lot to me because I, I could feel like, like the, the morality of preacher is what I love about preacher so much. I, I love that it, actually stands for something and it means something i mean you know i think that if you look uh at a lot of the vertigo books at the time and any mature reader i shouldn't even single out vertigo there but a lot of them are not about anything and 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 preacher is about something and and it's about and it's about love and it's about it's about taking care of your friends and it's about Things like that, and Garth's back. So, hello. Yeah. So, give me someone. Give me a question because my babbling is nonsense. Uh, uh, do you think you have another long preacher slash boy size story left to tell? Um, I don't think so. But I mean, who knows? But right now, uh, from this particular vantage point, no, I, I do not think so. I think I. Um, I have several long graphic novels in me. Um, mm. The String Bags came out a couple of weeks ago, and that was a format I was very happy working in. And I would imagine, well, I could definitely see myself doing a few more of those. Mm -hmm. But anything of the nature of Preacher or The Boys or Hitman or even a long run on The Punisher... I sure. don't think so. I think I'm much more comfortable doing shorter stories. Shorter stories. Okay. Um, do, um, is, is that a thing you know before you start writing it? Or is that just how you've developed today? Do you know what I mean? Like, because, because it seems to me that you could, you could go, oh, this seems like it'll be a good lark. And then, oh, wait, no, it's actually a much longer story than I. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting That's because, because the, the question there is, um, does the character have more life than the six yeah. issue you want to, you, you want the six issue story you want to tell? Yeah. As opposed to, um, is there necessarily a 60 issue story to be told here? And there's a distinction to make. You can create a very simple character, like, say, the Punisher, mm -hmm. and you can tell stories with that character forever, but that's not like Preacher or The Boys or Hitman with that beginning, middle, and end thing. That's that's more creating a commercially viable character that you intend to carry on, perhaps even in the hands of a different writer. Sure, but, you're, uh, but your run on, certainly your run on Punisher was as long as, or close to yes, at least, yes, as, yes, as, yes. The, as the other books, right? And so... It, it was. And, and yet at the same time... Um, I would not, I, I don't think I would advance a claim that if you look at that uh, Max run on Punisher, yeah. uh, which was 60 issues, while there are definitely threads and themes running through it. It's not one continuous, yes. I, right, yeah. right. I, I think there, there, there's definitely aspects of the last arc that conclude uh, sure. aspects of maybe the third or the fourth. There's no doubt about that. But that doesn't that doesn't make it a book like Preacher, which has a definite end and is not intended to be returned to. Um, I would imagine that that by the end of my life, when you thought up all the Punisher stories I'll have told, I wouldn't be surprised if it was twice the size of Preacher. But that doesn't sure. mean that it's a story like Preacher. It's just a series of stories. Featuring Absolutely. But but I so I guess the question that comes to my mind is. You you was preacher a sixty plus issue story in your yeah. head, was it? So, but but certainly, Vertigo was not yet established enough that you could guarantee you were going to get all those issues. 
Uh, right? Because I remember other books launching around the same time. Oh, yeah. I want to say, I mean, I don't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the book is. Yeah. Uh, that lasted 12 or 16 issues because oh, sure. people just went, no, I don't want that. Yeah. Um, I mean, so- nothing. Nothing was guaranteed, and yet at the same time, by I mentioned earlier that the sales kind of went down and then up again over that first year. And by the end of the first year, we were pretty secure. Sure. And uh, we we were all of us pretty confident that the thing was going to go the distance. Um, and I mentioned also that by the end of the second year, I'd figure out where the story was going. And at that point, I thought, yeah, I reckon there's three, maybe four more years in this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it proved to be, uh, but we, we were, we were reasonably confident, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, when I started the thing, uh, I had no sense of how long it was going to last at all. I always said that I was never surprised that by its success, but I wouldn't, I would have been equally unsurprised by its failure. Had that been, had that proven to be in the way things had gone, um, on maybe the boys, I was a little more confident that the thing would survive long enough. Uh, I know it took a weird turn six yeah. issues in, yeah. but in terms of, but in terms of the commercial success of the story, I figured, yeah, I'll probably be all right on this one. Um, Hitman is a better uh, example, actually, when you're thinking about Preacher, because uh, it, it had that same sense at the beginning of, well, throw it against the wall and hope it sticks. And you're absolutely right. So many Vertigo books uh, just crashed and burned inside a year. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, it seems like it's it's easy to write a good pitch. It's hard to sustain that pitch over yeah. an entire game, yeah. I suppose. Um, yeah. uh, what would you say uh, uh, is the difference in approach between writing a monthly uh and writing something that's more aimed at a graphic novel and 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 like with that i you know and we have a copy here hold on half a second uh dear dear becky is the is the mo right yeah uh yeah. did was this written as did you write this at as 120 pages or were you writing this in 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 six 20 page chunks. I wrote that pretty much in one go. Yeah, uh, yeah. As what eight issues? So what's that? 160. 160 yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I, I wrote that in one go, intending it to be uh, a one shot. It, it takes it takes an aspect of the longer boy story and focuses on that. An aspect specifically Butcher's relationship with uh, with his wife uh, that I always wanted to do more of. Uh, I really wanted to write uh, Becky Butcher, uh, Butcher's wife, more. I wanted to give her a fair shake, and I, I really felt that I, I that I hadn't at the time had the space to do it. And sure. this seemed like the ideal way to do it. Um, I, I suppose the answer to your question is deciding from the beginning that something's going to be a long form book, as as I believe they're called. It just gives you that bit more room to maneuver. It allows you to stretch out the threads a bit more. Uh, if you decide from the start that it's only going to be six or eight or whatever, um, you, that, that's what you limit yourself to. And then, you know, who knows? I've written things where I took a fancy to maybe doing another six issue mini. Um, something like Wormwood or um, Red Team or something like that, and then you stop because you realize that's as much life as it has in it. Sometimes you just want to scratch that extra edge. Yeah, I, I guess I guess the the question I'm asking is, um, I'm, I'm I'm sorry for for trying to phrase it the right way. Uh, uh, it, does it change the way you tell a story? when you when you have a limit of eight versus 20 versus 160 yeah. pages yeah. um and and yeah talk, expand on that if you can it it stops you doing that thing where if you've got a long form book you go i know i'll have to tie this up at some point but hell i'll do it around issue 47 i'm only on issue 13 so not so instead i'm gonna focus on whatever it is you're particularly interested in at that time. If you're doing six issues, um, you're required to be a little bit more disciplined. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Very good. Um, so we're, we're pretty much at, guys, we're almost at two hours here. I'm not going to keep you forever. I'm going to, this will be our last question here. This one from Spike Lee. Um, how do you feel about the TV adaptations of your work? Since you have to sacrifice a lot of control, do they still feel like your children at the core? Um, I tend to think of them as basically separate entities. Um, once, once I step away from them, uh, and I'm essentially not involved creatively, I, I do not work in Hollywood and really have no desire to work in Hollywood. Um, I think the most sensible thing is rather than beating my head against that particular brick wall is stepping back and simply uh, enjoying them like any other viewer. Um, to be more specific, I think Preacher was okay. Uh, I've said before it didn't exactly set the world on fire. Um, I thought the cast was great. I thought it was a great looking show. Um, I thought that the writing was up and down. Sometimes it matched the book, sometimes it didn't. Um, the Boys, I think, is a couple of classes better. I think the reason for that is that The Boys is a much, much simpler concept. Uh, you can do it in that classic Hollywood one line, superheroes are shits, they need a slap, these are the boys that are going to do it. And that's it. Try doing that with Preacher and you find yourself stumbling through paragraph after paragraph as you keep remembering one more aspect of the book you have to mention. The same is actually true of Hitman. Uh, so I think adapting the boys was was a simpler task. It's it's basically a a, a simpler beast, a more a more streamlined story uh, in terms of its very essence. Yeah, no, I'll agree with that. I uh, I, I you know my my if I it doesn't really matter what I think, but my my problem with that, especially that first season of Preacher, I, I just didn't. I they they miss the order of the relationships and. And they had Cassidy betray the relationship before the relationship had existed. And it just, it didn't like, it didn't work as a through line of the emotional right. core right. or whatever. I mean, I, I think if you look at that first season, it starts really well with two great issue, uh, yeah. issue episodes. And then they start to lose control of it a little bit. And yeah. then I think in the, the second season, exactly the same thing happens Two great episodes that more than live up to the book, yeah. to the promise of the book. And then again, they lose their grip on it. Um, but preacher is a strange beast. It surely uh, is. And there is no saying that, um, that a more direct literal adaptation of it would have been any more successful than the thing they actually did, which ultimately did last four seasons. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which I suppose isn't bad. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think that certain things in this comic could actually ever get adapted as a straight adaptation in any case. Right. There are it just many wouldn't things, work. Right. It's a comic book. It's, it my it work works that, as a comic book. Yeah. 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 There are many things in my work that you will never see on the screen. Exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, look, I, I, I want to thank you for making comics, man. I, um, I, 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 I own a comic book store because of people like you and, and because I believe in the thing that you do and I and enjoy not only just reading your work and, but selling the work as well. And this is, I, I preacher was such a great comic, uh, uh, and I'm really glad that we're able to put this out and have this, this conversation about it. And uh, thank you, Garth. Well, thank you, Brian. I mean, I, I should say that, I mean, your enthusiasm fuels my own, uh, the enthusiasm of you and people like you. I mean, I've, yeah. I believe in this medium just to exactly the same extent, if not more than when I first discovered it, I described yeah. earlier, hitting that sweet spot at 16 as Alan and Frank and people like that were starting to kind of stretch the boundaries a bit. And I believe in the medium just as much now as I did then. Um, and, I, and I get Brilliant. just as much enjoyment out of telling stories in the medium uh, as I did as I did when I started out. So, uh, and, and as for Preacher, uh, specifically, uh, look, it's been a pleasure to talk about it. I said to you earlier before we, we got started that um, I'm really glad that the book I, named, I made my name with is one I'm still enormously fond of. Yeah. It's not one I'm embarrassed by or 
I'm sick of talking about, or I can still talk about it as you can as you can tell uh, all day and all night. I'm happy to. So uh, yeah, it's always a pleasure talking about preacher. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is there anything you'd like to plug uh, upcoming or? Uh, if you feel like it, if you don't, that's totally cool too. But I, I always I mean, give people the chance, you know. Sure. I mean, uh, dear Becky's just started. String bags just came on it. I think apart from that, uh, the stuff you're going to see from me over the next few months is probably going to be um, trade paperbacks uh, and collections. You're going to see out of the blue. You're going to see a walk through hell. You're going to see the new Punisher book out. Um, Looking further ahead than that, uh, there will be a new series, a, a new mini series coming out soon from uh, Axel Alonso's um, okay. new outfit, yeah. uh, and that will be out, I guess, towards the end of the year, maybe. But uh, the, uh, I suppose the most I can tell you is uh, Goran Suzuka and time travel. Oh, that's cool. Oh, I like that. Uh, someone was asking me about uh, Sarah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. The TKO yeah. book. Are you going to do more with that? Uh, well, anyone who's read it knows that it comes to quite a final conclusion. conclusion. Yeah. just but. Um, but that is, you have mentioned one of my actual all time favorites. Uh, Brian Vaughn told me he reckoned that was the best thing I've ever written. And I'm not sure I'd argue with him. I am yeah. tremendously fond of that book and that character. Um, but as I say, it does have quite a finite ending. Um, I, I would like to write, obviously, more war stories, but I would like to write more about the Russian, the Soviet experience in World War II. I'd like to write more about Russia's women warriors. Um, I have an idea for a story about the partisans, and that might be where I go uh, next in that particular direction. Sweet. Awesome, but I'm. I, it's always nice to mention Sarah because I was enormously fond of that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Uh, so thank you, thank you, everybody who tuned in for our inaugural uh, uh, graphic novel of the month club, the comics masterpiece one. I gotta remember that. That's hard to remember all of my dialogue. I don't have s signs or anything have signs anyway um but thank you garth thank everybody for who sat through this we've had at least uh at least a dozen people who've been watching for the whole two hours so that's really good and people will watch this uh till the end of time thanks we'll see you All guys right, next you. month uh thank you garth thank you. and uh next month's book oh next month's book will be oh boy seed of destruction Ooh, from mike Mignola. this will this will be a good book so uh thank you everybody We'll see you next month.